welcome to everybody else that is actually here live. I have some friends, uh, colleagues, uh, clients, family, all kinds of people that are connecting with us. So the first thing I want to do is I want to, hi, Bob. I want to say why I'm doing this and why, Jeffrey, I have invited you. And then I'll read a little bit about your, your background. A couple years ago, two and a half to be exact, right before the pandemic, uh, I was at a networking event and telling somebody what I do. And I created this program called Mastering Under Pressure. And she said, you know, it's really interesting, um, but it's really not urgent <laughs> what you do. And now somehow or other managing oneself under pressure, good mental health, all the skills that are needed in today's um, world are extremely, extremely important. So Jeffrey, you and I have been together for about four or five years and I have watched you, you have watched me. And let me, let me introduce you. The market and I can read there we go, great. So let me introduce Jeffrey informally. Jeffrey is a primetime television host of C-Suite with Jeffrey Hazlett and executive perspectives on C-Suite TV and business podcast host of All Business with Jeffrey Hazlett on C-Suite Radio. He's a global business celebrity, speaker, best-selling author, and chairman and founder of the C-Suite Network, home of the world's most trusted network of C-Suite leaders, the company he founded in 2014. Currently, he spearheads the growth of C-Suite Network and all its entities, including C-Suite Radio, the only one dedicated and fastest growing network for business podcast. So could we say, Jeffrey, that you've been involved in business <laughs> pretty much a good part of your whole career? So again, part of what I want to talk about is, and have you talk about, Jeffrey, is that I know that a lot of the patterns that created in childhood impact us as grown-ups, And having this be part business, but really part, how do you manage yourself? And how did you get to be where you are from the inside out? I like to look at the inside um, first and then how that person comes out into the world. So tell us a little bit about your background, if you would. Yeah, I don't know. Do we have enough time, you know, to do all that? But we'll do our best. You know, we'll shorten it up. So great to see everybody. And uh, one of the things that you guys will get from me is complete transparency. Tina knows me well. I see my good friend Larry and a few other friends there, Johnson, a few others that are here, as well. Um, you know, look, um, I um, my father was in the military. My mother was a bookkeeper who became a very successful real estate agent. Uh, my parents divorced early uh, when I was uh, uh, 13, although they had a, a troubled marriage uh, and uh, loved them both very deeply. They both remarried. My mother remarried uh, twice, uh, two more times um, while I was growing up. And my, the last time was when I was a, a, let's see, a junior or senior in high school. I can't remember because... You know, uh, I didn't go to her wedding because uh, I was off on my own at that time. And my dad remarried a guy, a gal, gal uh, that was uh, six years older than I was. So, uh, which is kind of interesting when you're in high school and and uh, and your mother, your stepmother is only a few years older than you. But she had a cool car. She had a TR7, Triumph TR7, and I thought that was really cool. Nonetheless, uh, uh, but when my and I, um, let's see what what else I can throw out. I've been on my own ever since I was 16. So the time I turned 16, I was pretty much on my own. By the time I was a senior in high school, I was living on my own, uh, out of the house and doing my own thing by that time. Uh, uh, my my uh, my parents, my, my, when my mother remarried, just to give you the background, we moved all over the place, as you can imagine, being in the Air Force. He served three tours in Nam, so uh, gone. And I was lucky enough to have some very good role models, men, uh, who I met in the community, uh, who, uh, you know, it hadn't been for them, I wouldn't be where I'm at today, uh, so, who so became. Stop you there yeah. for a minute. So, so what were some of the things, the impact from the divorces and the marriages? And then yeah. let's, let me just. The, 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 yeah, the primary impact for the divorce and the marriages, my mother married a, a guy who didn't like me, just couldn't stand me. Uh, you know, saw me as a threat. I, this is how I look at it now. But, you know, back then just, and he had his own family as well. So he tried to blend the two families, didn't work well. 
you know, and I was the, I was always the odd person out being the, you know, being the, at that time, the man of the house, if someone would like to say it. I know people don't, probably don't like to hear that today, but that's what it was back then. And then my dad was, of course, gone. So I decided that, hey, uh, he's living back in South Dakota, where I loved it when I was a young child. So I'm going to go live with him. I'm leaving. And so I picked up and at 15 and went to, went to live with my father. And then, uh, and then he introduced me to my new mother. And, uh, and then, and, and by the way, just so everyone would throw, this is great therapy. Um, I wasn't allowed to talk about my mother in front of her or mention my family in front of her. So it was always odd. It was always weird and didn't, didn't, it didn't, it didn't work well. So yeah, by the time I was 16, I decided it was time for me to go find a better place. And, 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 and I got my own place actually, and had my own job. When I got, when I got to South Dakota, my dad was paying child support of $63 uh, to my mother per child. And that's what he gave me to live on. And I had to buy my school clothes, my, my meals, anything extra. So, you know, I went to work and uh, that's when I started working and making my money and doing the things I started to do. So, okay. So, so just being on your own, right. At such yeah. a young age, how did that impact then? You said you started working for yourself. How did that sort of that pattern um, kind of follow through in, in terms of your career? Well, I think you see it now. I'm a very independent person, extremely independent. If you test me, I'm way off on the spectrum. Uh, and it's, it's always been survive, survive, survive. So whenever the, you know, the chips are down or when there's tough situations, that's probably when I'm at my best, right? Because I got no, you know, it's like that scene from, from Officer and a Gentleman that many of you might remember when he was, they was, they was trying to get him kicked out of the military and he was pushing him through the hard stuff. And he says, I got nowhere else to go. And, and so if I look back at that stuff and I've looked back at it quite a bit to understand, you know, who I am and what I am and where did that come from? It all came from that period of time where I had nowhere else to go. I had to, I had to eat, I had to have clothes. I had to get my hair cut. I had to, you know, get a car. And, you know, my father was still there to help a little along the way, you know, make sure I got the right car, you know, but I bought it. It was my money, you know, uh, 1960 uh, Volkswagen Bug with uh, four extra tires, 500 bucks, her speed shifter, glass packs on it. It was amazing. Um, and I painted it with house paint, baby blue house paint with a brush. Uh, so, you know, just that, that kind of life. And, but, um, you know, so there, you know, there was good things that came out of it. And, and quite frankly, some very bad things. He was, you know, my, my, my father was also very abusive. Um, you know, military straight laced, but abusive as well. Um, and physical abuse, mental abuse to some extent, but physical abuse. And so, and, but that stopped when I turned 16 as well. Cause you so, got to because, be very it, big. <laughs> because I was as big as he, as he was. And, uh, and, you know, uh, I don't mind sharing this publicly, but I handed him the wrong wrench and he didn't like it. And he reached to hit me as we were working on his, then 1970 Ford Bronco. And I cocked back and said, go ahead, take your best shot because it's the last time you're going to be standing. And, uh, and then he looked at me and went back to work on the engine and we never had it again. So, so yeah. So let me ask you another question, Jeffrey. So you have these wonderful survival skills, which you yeah. um, clearly, clearly have. What were some of the characteristics that would kind of get you into trouble? I mean, you could share what I um, well, I got a lot of those. I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I suffer from depression. I didn't realize it until very late in life what that was. And I don't, I, I now know when the triggers come. So that helped, that's helpful to know, but it took me a long time to figure some of those out. Um, my, my, uh, my other safety mechanisms that are bad is I, I flee or don't want to get too attached because the, someone's going to leave me or not be, I'm not going to be included, you know, you know, there's, there's, I still remember before my mother died, there was a picture of my brother and sister and her as a family portrait on her wall without me, you know, so, you know, these are things that you look at and go like, you son of a, you know, and, but so, so I didn't always feel like I fit in. And quite frankly, that's carried through, most people wouldn't believe that about me, but that's carried through my whole life, you know, in terms of, 
of, of, of the person that's the closest to me is the person that's going to burn me. And the people around me won't, won't protect me. Right. So, so those things, so, so those, those are tough things. So I go into dark spaces many times with the people who are closest to me because I'm waiting for them to leave. Right. I'm waiting for them to bail out. And that goes with coworkers as well. I mean, right. I mean, it, yeah. it, it's every, it's all those things, yeah. deep friends that, you know, I could probably count. I make good friends with people and I'm good, you know, and I'm, but there are, there's very few people that I would count on my, they're going to carry my casket list. Right. That, that really, you know, no. And those are mostly people I hunt with because if I can trust them with guns, I can pretty much trust them with anything. So, <laughs> so I want to say number one, thank you already, you know, yeah. for being transparent. Part of the work that I do and my mission is to help people just kind of accept that we're all human and yeah. we do have these dark spots. We do have these great spots. And the more we talk about it, the more that people can recognize I'm not alone. And, um, and particularly people, Jeffrey, in your position who have really kind of been incredibly successful in spite of some of these things that you have, you know, you have found your way in spite yeah, of- Yeah, it's, it's amazing, Tony, because I say that, you know, I said, or Tina, that I sit here and, and say this, and then it's like, first of all, it's painful. That's one. Two, um, you think back about this and go, shit, how'd you even live? Or how are you alive, right? Much less the stuff right. that you do or have done, you know? So it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, and it's not easy some days. It's some days it's pretty tough, even though you, but you got to put on the face and put on the makeup and show up in front of the camera and do the shit you do. And, and I think that's what most of us do every single day, right? Yep. And so I also know that you have a beautiful wife and um, yeah. two fabulous kids and two beautiful granddaughters. How yeah. have you managed keeping those relationships as solid as, as they are through all these different iterations of your career? Because you picked the right partner, that's one, right? Because I know me and I would be married to me, right? <laughs> so that's number one. So the realization that, you know, you know like, let's be clear, most, most guys are pretty... I, at least most guys I know are pretty much just assholes. And then, you know, we just not good as we should be as, as humans, as people and whatever. But, and by the way, if, if I hadn't have met her, I'd be dead. I have no doubt about that. I would have been, I would have been addictive. I would have been, uh, you know, fucked up beyond all belief and, and would have, I would have worked myself into a heart attack and grave. I can pretty much, that would have been the case. I have no doubt in my mind because of the ways that I was running to whatever that was, that would have, and, and work was everything, right? So, you know, let's be clear. I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm an addict. Okay. I'm a workaholic. Okay. I could easily be other addict, uh, dependent as well. Like I have to watch it with alcohol and so forth and so on, because you're an addict. If you're an addict, you're an addict. And so other things usually pop up with that. So I'm lucky I don't have those things, but I am a workaholic. I mean, I went to a, you know, my wife finally at one point said, you, you got to get this fixed because this, you're working too much. You're, you, you, it was all encompassing, you know? So I went to Malibu at that big famous clinic where they have the sex addicts, the alcoholics, the every kind of addict you got, you know, and I'm sitting in the back of the room, figuring out the take and figuring this is a good business, you know, and like, can do that. I mean, that's, that's how bad it was, you know? you know, sitting there going, they got a book, a book with a ring binder. How much is that? And, you know, I was figuring out how to run that business, you know, so, so that tells you how bad it is. So, um, but yeah, she's, if it weren't for her, and then of course had two great kids that I did my best not to instill the same bad things or traits that, that would come through, hopefully did a pretty good job of that. They're pretty good kids. Um, so yeah, you know, my daughter has more of my work ethic and my mannerisms and the things that instill her business, but she looks like her mother and my son acts more like his mother and looks more like me. So. Yes. Not sure who got the good end on that deal. <laughs> so what kind of advice would you give aspiring people who really want to be as big as they possibly can? Because you and I know the, the pitfalls. Yeah. 
I think the 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 biggest thing is to find. So I I did, luckily luckily one of the things that I had in my career is I spent a lot of time in Asia, mostly in Japan. And it's interesting because because my daughter is believes in a my daughter and my wife will sometimes see other sides of the world, right? So they'll see people who are in contact with other spiritual things. Make sense for everybody? Yeah. And um, and I and I see some of that stuff. I get it, but I don't pay too much attention. But but both of them had people tell them that I was a former samurai at one point in a former life, which is interesting. And where I feel the most peace in the world, quite frankly, has always been in Japan. It's kind of an interesting piece. But I spent a great deal of time there, and one of the and I studied Aikido, and then the other thing I did was I learned a lot about the culture and language. And the, the biggest, biggest thing that I would give people advice is to find the core or their, what I would call their center and find out that, you know, your center, how do you find your center of who you are mentally, physically, and everything else that that's around you and, and understanding that, that, so when you go off one way or the other, you can always come back to that and, and hold that at the core of who you are and what you are. And so no matter, you know, what they call you or what you do or, or, you know, how much money you make and uh, all that other stuff, none of that shit mean, it doesn't mean anything. It's all about that core and the center of what you think and what you do and how you represent yourself. And then, you know, it's like everybody always asks me, so Jeff, what's, you know, what do you want to be known for? And I said, just a great grandfather you know, good husband, good father, but mostly grandkids. Cause you, you've kind of, you know, I've, you know, I've gotten as far as I can with my wife. That's about as good as I'm going to get. And my kids that you know, did that, you know, whether, you know, and I, I appreciate, you know, some things they'll, they'll grow to appreciate more, but right now I got to work on the grandkids, you know, so that's, that's kind of my thought, you know. Beautiful, beautiful. And can, and also what kind of sacrifices have you had to make in order to kind of feed this addiction, this workaholism? What kind of sacrifices have you made? That's a good question. I don't sacrifice much, meaning I do what I like to do the way I like to do it. But I, you know, has it impacted me? Yes. Has it caused me to make mistakes or do things without question? You know, so there's, there's, there's sacrifices along those things that I've, that I've caused as a result of those things. Um, but I can't, I, I can't put much on that. I haven't thought about that, to be honest, be blunt with you, transparent. Okay. Well, we have a few more minutes and, and I would love to open this up for people to be able to ask you questions. Um, because again, sure. you're a terrific role model, Jeffrey. Uh, again, for all the, all, this, all the good that you've done and, and all the caring that you have for people. And I don't know that everybody knows you exactly that way. Um, but those no, I think most people see me well, you know, here I am sitting in a, in a I'm in Miami today at a, at a, a new television studio business that we're that I'm involved with. And um, most people like even in this business, this is Americana media, which is think of it as the Fox for Hispanic conservatives, right? And most people would peg me as that. And little do they know I'm a Democrat. I'm a former chief of staff, you know, for her. Senate majority leader, Democratic side, so forth and so on. Most people would see me as a hard ass. And there are some things that I probably come off like that. But if you really get to know me, I'm a pretty nice, easygoing guy, uh, very balanced on that stuff. Uh, you know, most people would see me as a big white guy, you know, uh, you know, that, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't see, <laughs> would say they wouldn't see color, but see color. I mean, all the things that you would think would, would not be good attributes just because of my position, right? Or, or, or what I do or what I've done in business and, and wouldn't see the other side. I, I would agree with that. Awesome. So we have two questions. So Brian, Matamore, you want to come off of mute and ask your question to Jeffrey? Sure. I, um, I heard Jeffrey speak in Stanford, Connecticut one time, and he was talking about his experience as a CMO at Kodak, or maybe I'm remembering incorrectly, but um, but here's a company that failed uh, for the most part. And, and yet somehow he framed it in a positive way. And, and for me, I would have been a victim of that failure. And somehow Jeffrey made it seem like it was a success. 
And I'm wondering how he did that. Well, I mean, um, so it's about values, right? I mean, what are the values that you you put forth and what you want to do? I knew going into that job that my I'm probably not coming out of this too good because of where that company was at at the time. But my experience and things, my experience and things on that, um, I'm I'm on air. Just two seconds, thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, my my experience. Um, was about what am I supposed to do? What is my conditions of satisfaction about what I'm trying to drive, Brian? And to me, it was about trying to do as much as I could to save an iconic brand. And still in the marketplace that I have, and Larry's from that marketplace, you know, that was the graphic arts industry, which was the core of everything that we did. And the photography business was, you know, trailing off fairly quickly. And so if you look at what's left in that company and what's there, it is that business that I brought forward, brought up, brought through. That's still at the core of their profit today, of their core business. So, and the other piece of it was, you know, is is what is, am I supposed to do to help take care of people? You know, you know, I can imagine what it was like to cut 8,500 8, 8, people in a year from their jobs and how, how you take care of them and what you're supposed to do, you know? So some of us, you know, like, I, I will tell you one time, Brian, I was on a board of where uh, the, the former chairman of the, of or the chairman of the company, now former, tried to take the company over and buy the company from the sh stockholders and basically steal the company. Man, that's the best way to describe it. Hey, Jeff, we lost your, and, your audio. Or to do it, in, or to do hey, it Jeff, incorrectly. Could you, Jeff, could you repeat the, you were just going to say you're working with the chairman of the board and, and you cut, cut out then or something. Yeah, cut okay, out. So, so working with the chairman of this company and it's a publicly traded company and the chairman came in and basically tried to buy the company without going through the proper procedures. And so myself and two other boards of directors said, no, that's incorrect, you can't do that. In fact, I was the only independent board member and the other two were board members that this chairman had brought on. And by the way, this was in the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And we, we opposed it and said, no, we're not doing it. Um, we, we didn't get paid. Uh, we ended up getting sued by him. We ended up sued by the shareholders because they were suing all the board members, even though we were doing the things that were right. And my wife once asked me, she said, why are you doing this? Why are you, you're getting sued, you're getting this and you're, you're, you're not getting paid for it. We're, we're gonna lose all of our stock in this company. And I just turned to her and said, that's what good people do. You know, so, so you have to be at the core of who you are and what you are. And so that's like, even with Kodak, you just have to be who you are and do what you're supposed to do, right? And I think people see that and, the, you know, that's, that's uh, and, you know, I had that dream in the back of my head, Brian, that I was trying to become the CEO maybe someday of that company huh. and, and, uh, and maybe turn it around and do the things and, but you know, that wasn't in the that wasn't in the cards at that time. So so I did it. I did the best job I could for why I was there, and then I and then I tried to make the best of it. So that's what I did every single day. So that's I think great. what you're Thank saying, you. also, Jeffrey, is that um, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror. That was my first book, the mirror test. That, that, my first book was the mirror test. You have to look in the mirror and ask yourself the hard questions every single day. And by the way, the answers aren't going to come from anywhere else. They're going to come back from the person that's looking at you in the mirror. Exactly. I mean, that's, exactly. I've always said that. I mean, you, you might get advice and counsel from other people, but in the end, you got to make the decision. So, you know, I wrote a piece Kathleen the other day has, that, yeah. I just want to jump in. Kathleen has a question. So yeah. Kathleen Caldwell. Hi there. Hi, Tina. So great that you're doing this series under the hood. Thank you. And to have Jeffrey Hazlett as your first guest. It's, it's golden here. Uh, Jeffrey, having known you for seven years now, I'd be one of your 12. <laughs> Thank but you. I don't want to be one of your 12 for another. No, don't. Years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. We don't want no, that. Yeah. I, I want to do that, but 50 years from now or so. Yeah. Yeah. There you yeah. Go. Thank you. So my question to you is, Jeffrey, uh, what do you think is your higher purpose for what you're doing now with the C-suite network and beyond? What can you say is your higher purpose now? Well, my higher purpose now is to bring the team up to a level to where they can run it and do it. And I can start to fade away into the sunset, right? I mean, that's, that's if, if you, you, I'm bringing people forward to, so that they could shine and be seen 
and that's both as both as the members and the community inside as it is the team itself right and and to you know and to start positioning it for the next transition of whatever that's going to be right and and um and so with that's the growth curve we've got a profitable you know i had some leadership in there that didn't quite have that going for it for a while and and then stepped in a few years ago and said mm, we gotta we gotta we gotta write the ship and we gotta turn it in the right direction and we gotta find our way and that was the big thing and so i think we've now found our way and um and we figured out how to how to make money with it and how to lead it so that which has been really good so and then and then how do we have the impact the, the, you know that's the biggest thing i mean to have members or members of the community come in and every day say you know wow that was worth the money you know that's what that you know that's what i want to see happen every day and then also learn to do the new things that we're leading that many didn't do before you know in terms of uh you know use your content to grow your business and and then create that that really trusted network they go hand in hand content drives community which drives commerce and that's the big piece that we that we're doing so and then i'm going to i'm going to try to step and repeat it in other places like you know like here and maybe there'll be a new announcement in the next couple of weeks about <laughs> how we do it in another bigger way too so there you go all right we have time for one last question teresa I saw you before. I was going to I was going to ask Jordan's question, but he's now where he can ask. OK, go ahead, Jordan. First of all, hello. Um, glad to Hi, be here. Jordan. Um, how has PR been a significant help for you um, and your journey? How is what? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. PR. PR. PR? Yes. yes public relations how's public relations help me yes all right well um well <laughs> i think if i if i look at pr by the way that's how i got started in the business was doing pr right public relations i think it's changed over time i i, I think what it's taught me is how to do it with greater scale scale but more importantly how to tell the story right and the, and, and i think that's what we learned is our life is stories and so what is the story do you want to have? Is it going to be a romance novel? Is it going to be a drama? Is it going to be a comedy? Is it going to be tragic, right? And what we find is we're going to have all of those pieces in a chapter. They're all going to be chapters in our life in some way. Some of them are shorter, some of them are longer. And, um, you know, and, and, and some of them have great endings and some don't have great endings, right? But I, I think what I've learned is this, uh, the PR side of that is, one it's helped me to be bigger okay you know than 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 i really truly am i mean i'm still surprised when people you know recognize me or see me or my or my tv shows on you know playing on the seat next to me in the in the airline or whatever it might be and and so it's helped me to do that uh but it's it, but it's also helped me to be transparent and, cl and clear mm -hmm. and crisp and um, if the other thing you, that, you, you know, I think I do well, maybe not doesn't show right this minute, but I'm usually pretty succinct, succinct and, and very black and white. And, and I do my best to do that. And I think that's, that's, that's like PR teaches the who, what, when, why, and sometimes how. Yeah. And that's, that's the rules of PR, the five, the five, five points of PR. And so, and then, and then the other classic formula in PR is called race research action communication evaluation so first of all you look at it and say what could it be then you put it out of the action plan then you communicate it then you evaluate did it work rinse and repeat basically over and over and over so so that's always been a formula i've always kind of go by when i kick new things off or do things so jeffrey we're out of time we could go on and i know you have so much more to share and so much more wisdom to share but most importantly, I want to thank you for sharing you. And well, really thanks. Thanks for making me cry. <laughs> a little bit. You couldn't tell, but maybe you could. I got my voice cracked a couple of times. I yeah, a little so. sense. Anyway, thanks so, a lot. I appreciate that, Tina. That's really good. <laughs> I have to say, as Jeffrey got to know me, he said to me one time, he said, you're the one person that when <laughs> walking down the hall, you're going to tell me exactly what I don't want to hear. So, <laughs> yeah, which is I'm good. That was a compliment. 
It was yeah, a compliment. I, 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 By the way, we should all have that. You know, we should all have conversations. We should all have thoughts. We should all push our bodies in ways that cause a little pain to break us through the next level, right? And that's that's kind of how I like to have conversations anyway. So yes, real, true, deep, and honest. So thank you again, Jeffrey. Thank you everybody else for showing up and join us next uh, month where uh, Robert Wally, wh who works for Deloitte, is one of the VPs, um, good buddy of mine from New York. He's gonna be our next guest. And then we have some other wonderful, really fabulous leaders on, on deck. So thanks again for joining us and we will have this replay for anybody that wants it. See you guys.